Come in. Come into this place which we make holy by our presence. Come in with all of your vulnerabilities and strengths, fears and anxieties, loves and hopes. For here you need not hide, nor be anything other than who you are and who you are called to be. Come into this place where we can touch and be touched, heal and be healed, forgive and be forgiven. Come into this place where the ordinary is sanctified, the human is celebrated, and compassion is expected. Come into this place. Together we make it a holy place. Our first reading this morning comes from the book of Genesis, chapter 2, verses 4 through 9. Um, using the Common English Bible translation. On the day the Lord God made earth and sky, before any wild plants appeared on the earth and before any field crops grew, because the Lord hadn't yet sent rain on the earth and there was still no human being to farm the fertile land, though a stream rose from the earth and watered all of the fertile land. The Lord God formed the human from the topsoil of the fertile land and blew life's breath into his nostrils. The human came to life. The Lord God planted a garden in Eden and in the east and put there the human he had formed. In the fertile land, the Lord God grew every beautiful tree with edible fruit and also he grew the tree of life in the middle of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So now let us enter into a time of silent meditation, reflection and prayer. I invite you to close your eyes or you may even leave them open slightly to find a posture that is comfortable for you. And to begin just noticing your breathing. To connect each breath with that first breath. Do not worry so much about thoughts that enter your mind, but simply notice them. And then let them pass. Our second reading this morning is from Genesis chapter three, verses one through seven. The snake was the most intelligent of all the wild animals that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say that you shouldn't eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the snake, we may eat the fruit of the garden's trees, but not, of, but not the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden. God said, don't eat from it and don't touch it or you will die. The snake said to the woman, you won't die. God knows that on the day that you eat from it, you will see clearly and you will be like God knowing good from evil. The woman saw that the tree was beautiful with delicious fruit and that the tree would provide wisdom and she took some of its fruit and she ate it and also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then they both saw clearly and knew 
that they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made garments for themselves. So I um, wanted to share um, my friend, Danielle Schroyer, with you today. And um, she's an amazing person. She's an author. She's a mother. She travels all over the place. She speaks at different conferences. She's been on the forefront of this kind of move movement within the Christian community. Um, and I just will say no more. I will allow her to come up and let you experience her words and her profound wisdom. Danielle. Well, it's so nice to be with you all today. Um, I, Dave, I was so excited, mostly just because it was a great excuse for David and I to get caught up again. And I just have so enjoyed getting to know him over the years. And um, if communities of faith are places where we watch each other become good humans, um, I just feel honored that I got to watch David be such a good human for all those years. And it definitely inspired me to be a better one. So I'm really glad to meet all of you and um, to know his community of faith now. So um, I want to talk to you this morning about Genesis, um, and I have to say, at least I'm not talking about Noah's Ark. <laughs> it's really the one positive thing. I know you think that Adam and Eve are the hard story, but ooh, I don't know. I don't know anything good to say about that Ark story. That's it's really a tough go, so I have an easier job this morning, and I hope you'll leave kind of loving this story because... Um, I wrote a book a couple years ago called Original Blessing, Putting Sin in Its Rightful Place, and it was really geared toward Christians who grew up with this idea of that being a false story, and that we have, because of that story, been given this sin nature where our inclination is towards sin and evil and not towards goodness. And I just was trying to say, hi, that's not the only way that we have to look at this. And so I always like to start, actually, although I know that we are all in agreement that that's not what we believe about humans, um, it's really surprising, even to my progressive friends, to put that in sort of historical perspective. So just as a reminder, Judaism, whose story it is before it was ever Christianity's story, has never seen that as a false story. They don't believe in a sin nature that humans have. Islam, who also hold Genesis 3 as a, a sacred text, they don't believe in a doctrine of original sin or sin nature. And then um, the Eastern branch of the Christian church has never, of course, said that this is part of human nature. And the Celtic Christians in the Western side of the Western branch of the Christian church have also always disagreed with that. If you expand outward, of course, you think of Hinduism, Jainism, Buddhism, and of course, all of them think that we have this basic human goodness from which we can become the kind of people that can benefit the world. And so when you see it in perspective, you start to realize that despite the fact that we live in Dallas and almost everyone we know, if they saw that picture of Adam and Eve, they would say, oh, that's because Eve took the apple and ate and sinned and then the whole world got, you know, condemned. Like, that's the story that everyone knows. We are actually, that's deeply unorthodox in the global sense of the, of the term. Um, across all cultures and all time, Western Christianity, this one section, is the only group that has said that, right? So to reclaim this and to see this story as a wisdom story, as a tale of liberation, is actually just returning it to its natural place. And so that's what I kind of want to do this morning. Um, so Genesis 1 is the more popular creation story. I didn't have David read it this morning, but um, of course, it's cool that Scripture starts with two creation stories and they completely disagree with each other in details. It's a reminder that it's really not a scientific text about details. It's trying to just tell us something profound. But what we want to bring with us as we're looking at Genesis 2 and Genesis 3 from, from Genesis 1 is that we remember, of course, that God created the world and declared it good. Um, the reason this is unique and interesting is because if you look at the other creation myths that were written around the same time, um, those all were, they all said creation was a result of violence or um, destruction. Creation was a result of those kinds of things. And so the, the unique thing about the Hebrew text is that it said that, that creation was actually an act of benevolence. And um, on the sixth day, when God creates humankind, of course, it says, let us make humankind in our image. 
And so this declaration that humans are made in the image of God is brought forth from that. And then, of course, when God does this, God looks at everything and says, it is very good. And I know for us, we kind of take that as like a British thing, like we're sipping tea and we're like, oh, it's very good, you know. But in Hebrew, actually, there's a lot more passion involved, and it will tell you, like, this is a big deal. And so actually, in Genesis 1, when it says very good, it's more like jazz hands. It's like, woo, this is very good. It's not like... Oh, very good, very good. It's like, very good. So there's this emphatic declaration in Genesis 1 that's so beautiful that the world is a benevolent place and that, that God, the creator, has, has made this world with not only benevolence but also delight, that God delights in creation. So there's this sense of, of deep relationship and belonging and love, um, belovedness that we see. So then Genesis 2 gives us this 30,000-foot landscape view of how creation comes together. And so Hebrew, this is a cool little fun thing, that Hebrew tends to have these little plays on words, and one of them is that the word for ground is Adama, and then God takes the ground, you've heard this, right? God takes the ground and breathes the breath of life into it, and it becomes Adam, which technically means earthling. So the earthling came to life from the topsoil of the ground. Um, it reminds me actually of that, that cool conversation or the, the um, story that said about the Buddha that as he was sitting under the Bodhi tree, right before he reached enlightenment, he put his hand on the ground, on the topsoil of the earth. And um, some people say that because he put his hand on the earth, that's why he was able to reach enlightenment. It's this kind of universal sense where we understand that when heaven and earth unite and unify and come together, that something really beautiful happens, that that's where we have wisdom and enlightenment. And so this is the beginning of the origin of the human story, that heaven and earth, the breath of the creator and the topsoil of the ground come together to create humanity. Um, so God has created this fertile field, which is this wide, expansive space of creation. And within the fertile field, in this one tiny little section, God puts a garden. And that little garden has animals and plants and growing things in it and two very important trees, the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And so I like to point out in Genesis 2 that we can see that the intention all along was for the humans, the earthlings, to live in the fertile field. It even says that. It says, well, there was still no human to farm the fertile land. So the assumption in Genesis 2 in that verse is that there will someday be a human to farm the fertile land. So our intention was never, ever to stay in the garden. But for now, God places the earthling in this garden. Now, if I were to describe to you a place where you have food and clothing and shelter and all your needs are met and you have some chores, but it's nothing deeply strenuous. You may even have some little pets running around and you have a loving parent who walks with you and cares for you. What would that sound like? Right. It's childhood, right? So the Garden of Eden, if we see it symbolically, is this, it's the beginning of human life. It's, it's ideal childhood. It's the childhood we wish that every child would have, right? Where everything is going harmoniously and good. It's not perfect. It's not immortal. It's not any of these other things that we've said about it. It's just a really healthy, harmonious place to grow up and get your bearings, right? But um, what happens when children get to a certain age? I have teenagers, so I can speak from experience here. They begin to question things, right? They begin to question their parents' authority, and they think that maybe they are capable of ruling their lives perfectly. Thank you very much. And um, if we think about when this text was written, of course, it was during the exile, etc., we know that in this time, 13 and 14-year-olds were moving out of their parents' home, getting married, um, starting to work, starting a family, right? And this was basically still true in the early church as well. So it shouldn't be surprising that our Jewish siblings and the early church fathers and mothers considered Adam and Eve to be about the same age. They're about 13, 14, when things are about to shift really dramatically, so Western Christians, again, the only ones, have seen this story as a, as a story of human failing. But what if this is just a coming-of-age story? What if this is the inevitable process of growing up? It's just basic human nature. 
If we study psychology, of course, we know that there are these stages of individuation. There's this process that we go through to become adults. Um, and a really important part of that process is to differentiate from our parents or caregivers. We have to play around with, what is it that makes me me and makes you you? And how do I, how do I manage that? And if I do this, will you still be connected to me? How strong is this connection? We start to, we start to question those boundaries and, and that love, right? And if we don't do that, we actually are immature. We stay psychologically behind. We don't become our own person, right? But what else do we know about teenagers? Well, they're naive, totally naive, right? But also, they think they're inv invincible, which does not go together, right? Um, they are not capable of understanding the consequences of their own actions. And so they experience this deep tension between wanting to be in charge of their lives and not remotely wanting to be in charge of their lives. <laughs> so to, to me, this is like, it's like deep down they can feel that they are on the precipice of something kind of scary and big. It's, it's like somewhere deep down they recognize the significance of this threshold between childhood and adulthood, and there's some ambiguity and ambivalence about stepping over that line, which is where the serpent comes in. All right, so I'm a nerd about the serpent. I already warned David that I'm going like, to tell you more about a serpent than you ever wanted to know, and I hope you find it interesting. Um, so the serpent, in many ways, acts as this force that pushes them over the line from childhood to adulthood, um, and that's because the serpent is this universally powerful symbol um, there's a Jewish rabbinical commentary that said the serpent in Genesis 3 is a creature of enduring mystery. And that's about the simplest way to put it. Um, surprisingly, serpents are often good in global cultures. In the West, we're often, we just think they're creepy and they're evil and, you know, they have just this horrible connotation. But um, that has not been true across all time. In the Old Testament and in, in Judaism, snakes were admired, actually. Serpents were seen as not only honorable, but as actually divine in the Greek and Roman worlds. And maybe the most interesting of all, the Gospel of John, the writer of the Gospel of John, grew up in a time when the snake was admired like this, which is why it's possible that in John 3.14, he compares Jesus to a snake. He says, just as Moses um, lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. So interesting, and I can't go into all that now, but one of my seminary professors was so intrigued by that because it's so counter to what we would imagine, like who compares Jesus to a snake? That seems crazy. Um, he spent a decade studying symbolism of um, the snake in the ancient world, and he said there were 32 distinct meanings residing in the snake. It's amazing, right? Um, here's a couple of them. Serpents are often a precursor to rebirth or new birth. That's why Moses put the image of the serpent on a pole. If you remember that story in the Old Testament, that really weird story, there were these snakes like biting people and they were dying. And so Moses is like, what do I do? And God said, well, make a, a bronze serpent and put it on a pole and tell them to look at it. <laughs> and that worked. <laughs> I don't know what that's about either. But, um, and so this is new birth, right? You, you, you have poisonous venom, but if you look up at this bronze serpent, you are given a new chance at life. Obviously, Jesus speaks about being lifted up like a serpent, and he does that in the conversation he has with Nicodemus, which if you remember that story or know that story, Nicodemus comes to him and says, what must I do to be saved? And Jesus says, you must be born again. And Nicodemus is like, you want me to go back in my mother's womb? Like, what? He's taking that a little too literally. Um, but this makes sense, of course, because snakes shed their skin regularly. It's part of their life cycle. So rebirth, right? Snakes are signs of fertility. They till the ground and they kill rodents. There's even this um, rabbinical saying that says, um, if you want to have a good garden, you should put a snake in it. Which, when I found that, when I was researching for my book, I was like, so Christians are super scared of snakes, and the rabbis are like, man, you got to put a snake in that garden. Just put it in there. It's like composting worms. Like, stick it in. So it was very funny. Um, serpents are also a sign of healing. If you think, of course, you know that the symbol for medicine is a staff with a snake circled around it, right? That's known as the rod of Asclepius. Um, and the reason that that's the, the symbol for medicine is because a little bit of poison can hurt you and kill you, 
but a little bit of poison is also what can heal you. Um, and there's that balance that we are grateful that the Hippocratic Oath is taken by doctors, that they're gonna try to do the right dose of the poison for us, right? Um, it's cool to know, too, that Asclepius was the god of healing in the ancient world. And if you remember the story of um, the lame man who was by the pools of Bethesda that Jesus heals, the reason he was by those pools of Bethesda was, is because it was by the temple to Asclepius. And people would go there because Asclepius was the god of healing. Snakes are also this mythical symbol of totality or wholeness. This is gross, but if you think about it, snakes eat their prey whole, right? They just eat the whole thing. And that is really gross to think about. But so many psychologists have said, oh my goodness, this is why there's this deep symbolism. So um, Jung talks about the Ouroboros, is that how I'm saying, is that how you say it? Where it's the snake eating its own tail, right? You guys have seen that? And there's, I mean, thousands and thousands of pages of how that's part of human wit, the human wisdom stories that we're seeking um, to, to find within ourselves that own sense of wholeness and totality. If you remember, did anybody watch The NeverEnding Story as kids? Okay, you remember in the movie that there's the book and it's got the two snakes um, and they're eating each other's tails, but they're also in, an, in a, an infinity sign. It's like a figure eight, an infinity sign. And of course that makes sense because if you read the book particularly, you see that this is a hero's journey for this little boy who was scared and afraid and couldn't confront his mother's death. And then he goes through all of these, this hero's journey, all these trials, and at the end of it, he becomes brave and strong, and he's aware he can, he can like, make sense of his mother's death and come to terms with it. This is what snakes represent for us, this totality and wholeness that is waiting for us. There's also a snake known in fairy tales and in myths, um, and that's the trickster snake. Tricksters are ambiguous. You never really know if they're there to do harm or to just or to do something good, and usually it's kind of a little bit of both. But usually a, a trickster comes on the scene and creates what's called an inciting incident. So basically it's the point in the story where the action starts to happen. It's like the first five minutes of the movie, you get to see this is this lady's apartment, yada yada, this is her job, and then something happens. There's a turning point or a tragedy or a crisis, and that's when the real story begins. Usually um, that starts because of an inciting inst incident. So the serpent in Genesis 3 creates an inciting incident for these 13-year-olds in the garden. He's the most intelligent or the most crafty, right? And he comes to the woman and he says, did God really say not to eat this? And the woman says, oh yeah, if we eat that, we die. And then the snake says, no, you won't. What's happening, you'll, you'll see clearly, you'll start to know the difference between good and evil. So briefly, although I'm preaching the choir, I would like to point out that the reason this woman finds the fruit attractive is not because she is terrible, but because the snake told her that she would become like God if she ate it. And the entire book of Proverbs says that that should be everyone's goal. So we should see this woman as our hero and as an example for us because she is seeking after the exact right thing. And actually it says that she saw that the tree would provide wisdom and that's why she took it and ate it. So she's an example for us. She is the one who steps over the threshold. She's the brave one who takes that first step on the hero's journey. And then what happens, of course, is exactly what the hero said, or the serpent said. She doesn't die, but she gains this ability to discern between good and evil. And that's why it becomes a story of wisdom and liberation. If they had stayed in the garden and never eaten the fruit, this, this process toward wisdom and liberation would have never happened. In Judaism, this age of understanding and responsibility is both celebrated and ritualized. It's a bar or a bat mitzvah, right? Um, when a teenager becomes responsible to be able to practice the Torah on his or her own, after preparing for this special occasion and reciting it in front of the community, these teenagers are given a party and a ton of money and gifts, right? In contrast, Western Christians have decided that this is the fatal end of humanity, that we now have a sin nature, that women are a problem forever. They have used this as a way to justify patriarchy and religious shaming and fear-mongering for thousands of years. Like, let's go back to the party idea, right? <laughs> It's a much better way to look at this. Like, it's a little terrifying having a teenager, but like, there's, it's gonna be okay. Let's throw them a party and hope for the best. 
Um, so back to Genesis 3. So after they eat from the fruit, they, they're aware that they're naked. They make these fig leaves, right, and they hide. And God strolls along coming to check in. And now that they know they're naked, like they don't, you know, they don't want to, they don't want to show off. And do you remember as a teenager when that happened, or maybe a middle schooler, when you were like, Mom, do not come in here, right? Okay, There's no, that's maybe not shame, that's just getting older. You realize your body, you know something about your body that you hadn't realized before, it just hadn't dawned on you before, right? There's, no, there's not shame in that. Um, but in the, the rest of this story, if we had time to go through all the details, what you'd see is that there's no indication at all that the image of God goes anywhere or is tarnished in any way. And there's nothing that says that anything happens to their human nature. It doesn't say that they were immortal and now they're mortal. Obviously, Eve had a real clear sense of what death meant because she was like, we might die. So, I mean, she wasn't like, what is this death that God is speaking of? I do not know what you're speaking about because it doesn't exist in the garden. Like... None of these things are in the text itself. Um, And so what we see, actually, if we look at that story, is that God is really benevolent toward them. God takes these fig leaves that they have, which you've ever felt fig leaves, they're really rough and gross. And God actually says, oh, honey, no, like, here. And they leave the garden with these um, furs. They have, like, animal skin, which is soft and supple and water-repellent and warm. It's like a significant upgrade from the figs that they gave themselves, right? It doesn't seem like God's that mad about what happened, right? Um, There's also this section that we call curses, and the word curse is used, but I think these have been woefully misunderstood. I like to think of them as the talk you give your kid before they go off to college. You have to scare them a little. You have to level with them about the threats of the world. You know, you need to prepare them that actually, now that you're getting a job, Bills are hard to pay. Just be ready for that, you know? And that's what God is doing here. God doesn't curse the man or the woman. Technically, God curses the snake and the earth. But let's be clear. The snake has survived, like, the Ice Age, all the other ages. Like, snakes are the most enduring creatures. So, I mean, let's talk about what that curse is. And then God curses the ground. But does the ground grow vegetables? I mean, you have an entire... um, community garden out there like the ground is doing what it's supposed to do so we need to take this word curse with a grain of salt right um god tells the man look you are to bring life from the ground and that is going to come at a cost that doesn't come for free god turns to the woman and says you are the 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 bearer of life and you're going to bring life from your body and that's going to come at a cost it doesn't come for free That's just a straight talk about the issues of the world that you have to have when your kids can't hide from the suffering of the world anymore. And then God sends them out of the garden. And most of our English translations, I know mine did as a kid, said banished. And we need to banish that, actually, from this story. The word does not mean banished. It means sent forth or sent out. In other words, it's a benediction. When we gather together in worship, in the garden of worship to celebrate, we are sent forth and benedicted out so that we may do our work in the fertile field. It's not banishment, it's benediction. So Genesis 3 is the story of wisdom and liberation, right? God sends Adam and Eve out into the world because their purpose in life and the purpose of all human life is to practice wisdom. And you can't do that if you don't even leave home and get a job and have hard times, you know? You can't do that. If your job is to practice discerning between good and evil so that you can make the wise choice, you have to leave home. And you also have to make mistakes. God seems really not worried about this, right? It's all part of the problem. It's all part of the process. Our deepest wisdom often comes when we realize that we have done something wrong or that we've seen something in an incomplete way or we've made a false judgment about something. This is part of the process. God's like, good luck to you. Get ready for mistakes. Get ready for suffering. It's all coming your way. You don't even have to search it out. (laughs) Try to find that wisdom, right? 
Um, and this is the story that we see. Again, there's this benevolence that we bring through the whole story and also this sense of, of a wisdom adventure, the sense in which we're trying to figure out what liberation and wisdom means for us as a people and as a society and as, a, as creation. Um, Carl Jung said, all the greatest and most important problems of life are fundamentally insoluble. They can never be solved, only outgrown. This outgrowing requires a new level of consciousness. So listen, Genesis 3 is a cool, amazing story that we need to reclaim about children outgrowing their innocent consciousness. It is to be celebrated. It is to be delighted in, right? Now that they've gotten this new consciousness, this discernment between good and evil, it is time for them to go forth. When we begin life in the fertile field, we begin to move toward our own liberation. We become who we're meant to be. We distinguish ourselves from our parents because we're leaving home. We make decisions based on our internal motivation instead of our external motivation. That's how we get free. And if I had to summarize what holy scriptures are trying to teach all of us from all the traditions, I'd say that wisdom and liberation probably cover it, right? Scripture is this collection of stories about people who are trying to figure out how to discern wisely between good and evil, and to do so in such a way that brings about freedom. And sometimes they get it right, and most of the time they get it wrong, but all of the time we can learn from their stories. And that's why we still read them and share them, because all of these stories have wisdom to offer us. When we become wise, we realize, of course, that we live in an interconnected world. What I do affects you, what you do affects me. It means we become responsible to each other because we belong to each other. So it's a freedom not from, but a freedom for, right? Freedom for the greater good of all, for the benefit of all beings, for the enlightenment of all. And we only start to see that connection and recognize the depth of that connection when we become wise. Um, I'm reminded, actually, of this Buddhist story. You may have heard it before about the poison tree. So there's a poison tree that's, that's growing, and the first person who goes to see it says, oh, my gosh, it's a poison tree. We've got to cut it down before somebody gets hurt. And then the second person comes along, and the second person is a little farther along in the journey, the spiritual path, and, and the second person says, well, all right, let's not cut it down. The tree has, has a right to live. Um, so let's put a fence around the tree so that we're protected, but the tree is protected too. And then a third person comes along, and this third person is enlightened. And when this third person sees the tree, um, he says, Oh, great! A poison tree! That is exactly what I was looking for. <laughs> and the enlightened person takes the fruit from the poison tree and learns how to make medicine to heal the suffering in the world. Genesis 3 is a universal wisdom story about what it means for us to take suffering and difficulty and even the knowledge of evil, take that into our own bodies, embody that, imbibe it, and find out a way to make it medicine for suffering and for healing. It's a sacred tale because it tells us something about our humanity we desperately need to know, which is that we're born good that we bear the divine image of the creator, and that our task is to grow in wisdom and live for the liberation and healing of all. Um, the Christian mystic Hildegard of Bingen, I love her, she said that we are all born with wisdom like a tent, and our purpose in life is to set up our tents so that when we get older, we may live in them. Isn't that a lovely metaphor? So if we, if we see that as the story of Genesis 3, we see that God sent Adam and Eve out of the garden for this very purpose. In the fertile fields, they will find their wisdom. And in the fertile fields, their liberation awaits. So may we, like good earthlings, be sent forth with courage into our own fertile fields. And may we do likewise. Yes?